Steve Jobs was a genius of the modern age. He gave us tools to change our lives and the way we communicate. Here comes a device that comes with no manual and everybody knows how to use it. Amazing. They weren't just hits in the sense they sold well, but they actually changed the whole nature of technology and caused everyone else to follow them. This intimate portrait is a revealing insight into Steve Jobs' life. Andy Warhol gets down on his hands and knees. Steve showing him how to use the mouse. His career. He shook up a whole industry. His character. Steve loved those creative ideas. His faults. Steve ultimately betrayed everyone. His artistry. Just the smooth lines of it. And his achievements. He is going to inspire a whole new generation by the people who knew him best. I'd give a lot to have Steve's taste. Uh... If he needed you, he was your best friend, and he would seduce you. When I was having a hard time, would be on the phone, would drive up from you know, Silicon Valley, take me out to dinner and hang out, take walks with me. And... He turned on me, total street bully, in my face, scream. We were, and I went crazy. I'd never been there. I don't ever want to be there again. Thank you very much. How much fun we had in those days doing things together. You know, but you, you lose it. You can't ever go back. And just just have those, those conversations that make us both smile. Through their eyes, we reveal what made him the man who could say. We were able to change the rules of the game. Stephen Paul Jobs died of cancer on the 5th of October 2011 at the age of 56. His last words revealed at his memorial service, oh well, oh well, oh well. The impact of his death reverberated around the world. The news was spread and the tributes were created on the new eye devices that his visionary genius had made. The fact that Steve Jobs had finally logged out made headlines everywhere. This man really had changed the world. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is and you're your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. In this never-before-seen interview, a younger Steve Jobs gave a rare glimpse of his vision of the world. That's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it, you can influence it, you can, you can build your own things that other people can use. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. In the Los Altos suburb of San Francisco, California, just about everybody was an engineer or worked in electronics. A childhood spent here in the future Silicon Valley was the first key lucky break in Steve Jobs' young life. His closest childhood friend was Bill Fernandez. In about eighth grade, halfway through, this new guy came into the school uh, who was Steve Jobs. And we were both introverted, intellectual, kind of socially inept, and we gravitated towards each other. The two boys became firm friends. We started taking long walks and talking about the meaning of life and uh, what is this all about. And after a while, we started doing, in addition to walking and talking, doing electronics projects together. Fernandez also knew another electronics geek, his neighbor's son, Steve Wozniak, universally known as Woz. So one day, Steve Jobs bicycled over to hang out with me and do electronics projects in the garage. And out in front was Wozniak washing his car. So I thought to myself, OK, this Steve is an electronic buddy. He's an electronics buddy. They'd probably like to meet each other. 
Fernandez had no idea at the time that the meeting between his two friends would change our world. Jobs and Woz were soon to start a business together. Its name was Apple. If Woz and Jobs had never met, there never would have been an Apple computer. There would have been computers and there would have been personal computers. But we probably wouldn't have the kind of wonderful, empowering things that people fall into if Woz and Jobs hadn't met. The neighborhood we grew up in um, had a lot of Lockheed engineers on it. And I would go um, up and down the street to the various dads on the street and get mentored in electronics. And Steve Wozniak's father was one of the people who mentored me. As Jobs and I were walking over, I noticed Woz out washing his car. And I said, hey, Woz, um, come over and meet Steve. So Steve, meet Steve. And this is where it happened, basically right here. Woz and Jobs became inseparable. But their first electronics venture was not a computer. The pair developed a kit, mimicking telephone router codes to make free calls around the world. You know, when you make a long distance phone call in the background, you do -do 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 -do. Those are the telephone computers actually signaling each other, sending information to each other to set up your call. And there used to be a way to fool the entire telephone system into thinking you were a telephone computer. You could, you know, call from a, a payphone, go to White Plains, New York, take a satellite to Europe, take a cable to Turkey, uh, come back to Los Angeles, uh, and you go around the world three or four times and call the payphone next door and shout in the phone, and be about 30 seconds and come out the other phone. Was and Jobs moved on from phone jacking for fun to creating computers, building the prototype of the very first Apple. It's a fun memory for Steve Wozniak. He was always thinking about certain technology, the early products that got developed, the building parts, what those might lead to in our future. And he was always pushing me as an engineer, could you possibly add this someday? Could you possibly add that someday? Yes, 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 I could, thinking, no, it's way, way off, but eventually we all did. In those early days, Woz and Jobs took their creation to the Homebrew Computer Club in Silicon Valley, where it quickly attracted attention from their peers. I met both Steve, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, at a meeting of the Homebrew Computer Club in Palo Alto. Our first meeting was really simple, it was in the uh, parking lot, and I helped them unload uh, Woz's Fiat and carried in uh, what I guess was the first Apple I to show it off to the assembled multitudes. When that same first Apple I was auctioned in 2010, it attracted even more attention. It heralds the home computing revolution. This is the first computer where you use a keyboard and a screen to enter and read data. Selling for £110,000. From the hippie days of 1970s California, a handful of teenage geeks emerged to change how we work, play and communicate with each other. Founders can be divided into two camps. There are hippies and there are nerds. And Jobs was definitely the hippie and Woz was the nerd. And the hippie has the grand vision and the nerd is able to realize the vision. The nerd knows everything about women but doesn't know any women. You know, Steve knew women. So, you know, there's that distinction. So they really needed each other. He knew how to beat it out of Woz and he would do that. And his contributions at that time were saying, gosh, we could sell these things. I mean, which doesn't sound like much, but it's huge when you're dealing with a guy in Woz who would never thought about selling anything. I wanted it to happen so badly. I gave this computer away. I gave away the listings, no copyright notices, no nothing. And then Steve Jobs came and saw the interest and he said, why don't we start a company to make some money? And I said, fine. They did want to start a business. They raised money to start a business. They knew that they couldn't do it on their own. They sought out older people to help. And, and, and Steve Jobs, in particular, was quite persuasive. In Apple's earliest days, the two Steves, Jobs and Woz, took on an older and more experienced partner. Ronald Wayne now lives and works near Las Vegas. A fitting location for a man who walked away with nothing from a $37 billion no-lose bet.
Wayne was invited to discuss a business proposal with Jobs and was. That was the first time I met Steve Wozniak. He was a fascinating guy, fun, fun guy to be with. Uh, uh, very, uh, not only a fun guy to be with, the most gracious man I've ever met in my life. But Ron's opinion of Steve Jobs was not so hard. I wouldn't put gracious in his description. He had the kind of manner, the kind of approach to people and environments that were business directed, okay? He was extremely serious. Wayne acted as a referee in a minor difference of opinion between the two equal partners. Well, Steve Jobs was so impressed with my diplomacy in that particular situation that he immediately came back and said, OK, what we're going to do is form a company with Waz and Jobs getting 45% each, and I would get 10% uh, as a, a tiebreaker in the event of any philosophical disputes that might occur in the future. 10% of Apple today would be worth 37 billion, 631 million, 420,000, 312 dollars and 42 cents. But despite his share in the company, Ron was worried that working with Jobs and Watts might prove to be too stressful. At 40, I, was, I thought I was getting a little old for that. They were absolute whirlwinds. It, it was like having a tiger by the tail. So Ron decided to hand back his share for nothing and walk away with no regrets. A lot of people have the impression that somehow or other I got diddled out of something. Well, I did not. Nobody diddled me out of anything. Wayne may not be bitter, but he wasn't the only early Apple employee who made a life decision most of us would regret. The funny thing is that uh, um, Steve Jobs hired me, and he said uh, uh, he had he had he had hair just down to his waist at the time, and he and he, as I recall, he only ate fruit, and and he said uh, he said uh, we don't have very much loot, so we'd like to pay you in stock. I held out for the cash. <laughs> <laughs> When Steve Jobs first launched Apple, the computer industry meant mainframes and mini-computers. Huge devices sat in air-conditioned rooms and users worked on terminals. It wasn't a personal experience. The Apple II was the first computer that looked like a consumer electronic device. It was actually designed and they thought about the user experience and that it was intended really to be used by a single person in some interactive way that, that was enjoyable to the user. Different. Jobs drew on a diverse range of influences to feed his creativity, including a class he dropped into at college in Portland, Oregon, in the early 70s. Reed College as one of the best calligraphy courses in the US. His teacher had a major impact on his aesthetic and the clean lines of his products. We had many very bright students here, and we had bright thinkers and people that wanted to change things and improve the world. But Palladino witnessed firsthand the impact Jobs had on his peers. The other students brought him to me like they were bringing me someone very special. I guess they could see the dynamics already forming in his thinking. Jobs completed the course in 1974 but returned to Palladino just two years later, enthusing about a machine he'd created in his garage and seeking advice on a font. He was interested in telling me what he was doing and how he was using what he had learned in class, but he wanted some help with Greek letters because he wanted a Greek font and he couldn't find satisfactory models to go from. Before Steve started working on computer typefaces, they were in very bad condition, and any improvement would, would be a step forward. The resulting fonts appeared not just on Macs, but ultimately PCs too, dramatically improving the user experience. But not for Robert. I never touch computers. I write everything by hand. Getting letters in the mail is getting to be very rare.
After dropping out of college, Jobs went on the hippie trail, traveling to India and studying Buddhism. This also had an impact on his work at Apple. I first met Steve in 1975. He had recently returned from India. He's way ahead of his time. He wasn't the typical teenager. He asked questions that were a lot more serious than the normal 20-year-old. He was looking to understand the true nature of things. And I think he came to the Zen Center uh, to continue his search. Steve was very much taken with Zen, Zen Buddhism. Zen represents the relationship between things, things of the world. In Zen, it's expressed in the art. You see it in flower arranging, ikebana, you see it in calligraphy, you see it in artworks. Steve was very much taken with that, especially calligraphy. He noticed the way the lines and the spaces had a relationship. I think his genius was being able to take the principles of Zen and incorporate it into the products that came out of Apple. Much of what Apple did was built on the efforts of others. A 1979 deal gave him access to Xerox technology. One thing blew him away, a prototype mouse. He told his team to make one, only better. You gotta build it for less than 15 bucks. It's gotta last two years. I want it to work on the desktop, a normal Formica desktop. And I also want to be able to use it on my jeans. As I left the meeting, headed out to my car, I was thinking, is, does this really make sense? Is this Steve crazy or, or is there something here? If Steve wanted something to happen, his team just had to innovate. So for Dean, that meant a trip to the drugstore. As I entered Walgreens, I had in my mind, most importantly, was where do I find these spheres, these balls, to be a part of the mouse? And I had thought about the underarm deodorant as the, as the right solution. And I emerged with some roll-on deodorant and a butter dish. And as you can see here, there's, of course, different size balls, depending upon how it is applied. Not only that, but then I, once I had had the balls, I said, what's a quick way to have a structure to put around the ball so that I can start interacting with it? Now, I remember going to the housewares area and I found a butter dish, which was about, about this big. And uh, that became the beginning part for the mouse as I felt it. So I used the butter dish, the roll-on ball, and was able to create the prototype. Steve, always had the notion of simplicity. The magic of Apple products is simple. There was one button and it's magic. From the early days of the Homebrew Computer Club, one great influence on Steve Jobs was his complex relationship with friend and rival, Bill Gates. Apple's history interweaves with Microsoft's. Their CEOs, gave a unique interview to journalist Walter Mossberg. It was, to my knowledge, the only time they ever got on stage together to submit themselves to an extended um, interview with journalists. The interview gave Walt unparalleled insights into the dynamics of their relationship. From the start, Gates was overshadowed by the more polished, confident jobs. Uh, I made, I made, let, let me tell this story. <laughs> it was. <laughs> I'm not fake Steve Jobs. Uh, <laughs> they were partners, you know, for a long time. The very first Apple II computers had Microsoft software in them. We've kept our marriage secret for over a decade now. <laughs> but while the banter was good-natured, the rivalry between the two was deep-rooted. I personally can attest to having heard each of them say very nasty things about the other off the record in private uh, over the years. Neither person is uh, hugely likable. Certainly uh, Steve Jobs is an acquired taste and so is Bill Gates for that matter. Um, they're both uh, have their moments. Bill Gates is a better friend than Steve Jobs. 
but Steve Jobs is more fun than Bill Gates. Jobs had glamour and dynamism, and by the mid-1980s, he was one of the richest self-made men in America. He was just 29, which made him a natural subject for Playboy. Interviewing Jobs was a unique experience for writer David Sheff. The phone rang one day, and it was not a PR person who called, but it was Jobs himself. Um, and it really was an indication of the way that he did business and really continued uh, to do business. Apple was very different. The second you walked in the door, you felt like you were in a completely new environment. The conference rooms, uh, instead of, you know, number 103C, were called Da Vinci and Michelangelo and Picasso. And indeed, it was Picasso that I was escorted to, um, to see Jobs for the first time. As the two got to know each other, Chef realized he was getting a sneak preview of what was then an unimaginable technological future. Steve started drawing on a placemat. We went back and forth, and basically by the end of that, constructed what looks exactly like an iPad. Um, Steve said, this machine, this small device, as big as a book, would allow us to uh, keep in touch with one another. It would replace the telephone and would replace bookstores. He saw it as a reader on this very small device and read it with editing capacity, note-taking capacity. I mean, he really envisioned the iPad almost 30 years ago. Jobs and Chef quickly became close friends. Through sort of the late 60s and 70s in very similar ways, going through some of the counterculture, you know, being influenced by some of the Eastern mysticism, Buddhism, the LSD culture, Timothy Leary. He was always so excited about everything, and we went to movies together, and we went to the opera together, and he could talk about everything, and he was this incredibly giving, loyal friend. When I was having a hard time, would be on the phone, would drive up from, you know, Silicon Valley, take me out to dinner and hang out and take walks with me, and, um, you know, that's pretty rare. In 1984, they visited the home of Yoko Ono for the ninth birthday party of Sean, the son she had with John Lennon. Jobs took along a birthday gift that fascinated not only Sean, but the whole star-studded guest list. Steve opened it up, pulled out you know, what was one of those first Macintoshes off the assembly line, set it up on the floor. Sean was down on the floor with him. Steve turned it on put Mac Paint in there, it took him about two seconds to show Sean how to deal with it, and Sean pretty soon was drawing pictures. Later, Steve told me it was one of the first times he'd watched a child with a Mac. Eventually, I sort of became aware that there were some people you know, who'd come into the room, and I looked over my shoulder, and there was Andy Warhol. So there was this great moment that uh, I'll never forget. You know, Andy Warhol gets down on his hands and knees, with Sean on one side and Steve on the other side. I remember that Warhol would pick up the mouse and, you know, instead of gliding it along the floor, you know, the tiled floor in Sean's bedroom, he would sort of pick it up and was trying to figure out how to make it work. And Steve very patiently would sort of lower his hand down and said, no, you kind of push it along. So Andy sort of fooled around with it and he was completely mesmerized. I mean, when he zoned in on something, the rest of the world disappeared. And that was what it was like watching Warhol in front of a Macintosh for the first time. And then, you know, he got this big smile on his face and he looked up, he said, I drew a circle. For Steve Jobs, life had been good. He was worth a million dollars when he was 21. He was worth $10 million when he was 22. He was worth $100 million when he was 23 years old. So he knew nothing but success. And when you're 23 years old, you're worth $100 million, you are pretty damn full of yourself. And that's what Steve became. And so he was, he had a, a huge ambition. But in 1985, at the age of 30, his charmed run of luck was about to come to an abrupt halt. Seeking someone to help run his rapidly expanding business, he hired Pepsi executive, John Scully. There was kind of a, a love affair at the beginning. I mean, Steve really trusted him and really saw a kindred spirit, you know, someone who would help him build Apple. His love was Apple. He envisioned being with Apple for his life. He said, but that doesn't mean there won't be periods when I will leave and I will do other things and I will, you know, my life will weave in and out of Apple. Once again, Jobs' foresight was spot on. Two years after Scully arrived at Apple, 
the love affair turned sour as company profits faltered. After a boardroom battle, Jobs left. He felt so betrayed, uh, so angry, so disillusioned um, that you know, Scully was, in his mind, at least part of, if not the ringleader in what he viewed as a coup to remove him. And Steve was pissed off. Um, and he really was pissed off about, um, about Scully because he brought Scully in and trusted him and then felt betrayed by him. He founded a new company, Next, specializing in educational computers. Jobs had to hustle, so he turned to a man with deep pockets, Texan billionaire and former presidential candidate, Ross Perot. He picked himself up, dusted himself off, and started all over again with very little hesitation. And I really admired that. You know, otherwise you could just sit around in a dark room and, and sulk about it, but that's not Steve. But even starting small needs big money. I invested $20 million in Next. He contacted me, asked me to be a principal investor and to serve on the board with him, and I agreed to do it just because of my support for him. And uh, there's no question in my mind that if he, if he wanted to do it, it would get done. He's great with attracting and motivating the best of the best people. He's great at encouraging them to be creative and come up with new ideas and not just be little robots, which many big companies just want you to be a little robot and do what you're told to do. And the last thing they want to hear from you is a creative idea. Steve loved those creative ideas and that was a magic part of the success of Next. A new Steve Jobs arose from the ashes of the boardroom battle at Apple. He wanted more, and this time he was ruthless. He invested $5 million capital in a corporation called Pixar, and he took 70% of the company, and we took, the employees took 30%. Steve kept investing because we would run out of money and he he would not want he did not want to be embarrassed by a failure after having been booted out of Apple so he would put more money in and take more equity away from the employees so over the course of about four or five years he owned it all the new master was taking control from Alvy Ray Smith I would look at my employees looking at Steve and I realized they're in love you know they're just Looking at it, looking up at him with big doe eyes, just soaking in everything he's saying as if it's truth. And it wasn't. So you can see he was very disruptive. Our management style was to be two hours away from him, try not to have him come into the building. Standing up to jobs could be a painful experience, as Alvy found out in one memorable boardroom meeting. He turned on me, total street bully in my face, scream, we were, and I went crazy. I'd never been there, I don't ever want to be there again. That's kind of why, that's the reason I got away from it. We were screaming at each other in full bull rage, with our faces about that far apart. And during that, so he's insulting my Southwestern accent. It was just street bully stuff. I, I still don't know what happened. Uh, something broke. Uh, and during this face off, <laughs> literally a face off, I marched past him and wrote on the whiteboard. Now, it was an unspoken rule, which I hate, unspoken rules, that he, only he could sit in front of the whiteboard and only he could use it. Nobody had ever tested it, but at this point I tested it. <laughs> I marched past him and wrote on the whiteboard. He says, you can't do that. And I said, what, write on a whiteboard? And he stormed out of the room. So that was the, and then I was in shock for the next week or months or so. I just didn't know what had happened, you know. Everyone in Steve Jobs' life went through three phases. They were either being seduced, um, ignored, or scourged. And it all depended upon whether he needed you or not. If he needed you, he was your best friend, and he would seduce you. And then you would work like a dog, and if you weren't working hard enough, he would scourge you, and ultimately, he would throw you away. On the personal level, it was, it was not fun. It was not the way I want to be treated by another human being. Steve ultimately betrayed everyone. He's very civil when I, when I met him in, you know, in, in you know, functions and things, but he was very hands-on, not a great delegator. I would say not a great praiser of people. Um, 
uh, but it worked. I mean, it just you know, it was just un unbelievable how well how well it worked. And some said the new Steve Jobs was never averse to claiming all the credit. Disney took Toy Story and another one of their movies to New York for the critics to see, and the critics just. They didn't even look at the other movie. They just went nuts when they saw Toy Story. And they came back and basically told Steve that it was going to be a huge success. And that's when he, that's the point when his ability to see something spectacular is about to happen. He just moved in and exploited that right to the hilt. And I must say, he did a great job. He became a billionaire from it. Awesome. So Steve's genius is to move when he has a good idea. I don't think they are necessarily his ideas, but boy, does he know how to move and market them like crazy. He's the world's genius marketeer, including of his own self-image. But the best was yet to come for Jobs. Apple was in trouble, and they wanted him back. They were begging him to come back, because they knew he could fix it. And he did come back, uh, and he fixed it, and the rest is history. He came back to Apple and the company was almost dead, literally. It was like 90 days from going bankrupt. He said to the people uh, at this very demoralized, almost out of business company, we're not looking backward. I don't really care that we once had the first successful personal computer. I really don't care that we were famous and successful, we're not anymore, and this is where we're starting from, and this is where we're moving. Very, very it was an outside investment that ultimately helped to save Apple. But when Jobs introduced the investor on stage, it didn't go down well with the loyal Apple audience. Bill Gates was actually on stage rescuing Apple. Rescuing Apple. He did two things. He gave them $150 million, for which he got non-voting stock that expired after a certain number of years. And he promised to keep producing Microsoft Office, the Macintosh version, for, I think, five years. And so he was, he was on stage rescuing Apple. And yet the acolytes who were filling the room uh, had learned to hate him. They treated him as, you know, the, the devil, the antichrist, and they booed him. But Jobs, with his eye ever on the bottom line, had a different view. There were too many people at Apple and in the Apple ecosystem playing the game of, for Apple to win, Microsoft has to lose. And it was clear that you didn't have to play that game, because Apple wasn't going to beat Microsoft. Apple didn't have to beat Microsoft. Apple had to remember who Apple was. It was just crazy what was happening at that time. And Apple was very weak. And uh, so I called Bill up, and we tried to patch things up. I think he learned to be a better businessman. I think he learned a little more humility. Steve really changed in a number of ways. And he changed primarily because of, of failure. Failure affected him, and he learned from it. When he returned to Apple, Jobs created a brand new product, the iMac. A computer universally recognized as a work of art, unlike the PC. I've been trying to drag people off, off Microsoft stuff and, and uh, PC stuff. Because I remember still, I don't know if it still happens, you switch on a PC and a load of numbers come up. And I said, what the, what the fuck are these numbers? What is that, how much money Bill Gates has made? On stage, Jobs and Gates joked about the relationship between Mac Man Steve and PC Man Bill. PC guy's great. I, I like He's PC. got a big heart. <laughs> His mother loves him. His mother loves I'm him. I'm telling you. PC guy's what makes it all work. Actually. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's worth thinking about. Of the two of them, the one that took the bigger risks and change the game more often, it was Steve. It was Steve Jobs. Well, I give a lot to have Steve's taste. Uh, <laughs> he, he has natural, uh, it, uh, not a I joke at all. I, I think in terms of intuitive taste, both for people and products, the way he does things, it, it's just different. Uh, and, you know, I think it's, it's magical. Uh, and in that case, Despite their wow. long-standing rivalry, you know, they displayed a healthy respect and even affection for one another. 
you know, I think of I think of most things in life as either a Bob Dylan or a Beatles song. But there's that that one line in that one Beatles song. Uh, uh, you and I have memories longer than the road that stretches out ahead, and that's that's clearly true here. Oh, well, you know what? I think we should end it there. It was one of the uh, highlights of my journalistic career to be there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. In fact, we were uh, quite taken aback by the standing ovation and seeing some of the people from where we were sitting on stage actually shedding tears. It sounds strange, but it was actually an emotional thing. So I can move this with just a touch anywhere I want. Steve Jobs, now at the peak of his creative genius, was leading Apple to the peak of its creative success. The key to the success of the company was in moving beyond the computer, was in seeing how the microprocessor was, was getting so cheap that it could be applied to other consumer electronic devices. Innovative new products poured in a seemingly endless stream from Apple's development laboratories, pouring a stream of cash into Apple's coffers. 250 million or a billion or however many uh, iPods are out there, you know, are what, are what built the Apple of today, not the Mac. Approaching the age of 50, barely a quarter of a century after making his first million, Jobs was worth $2.3 billion. Now, he picked up the pace of Apple's evolution. Computers, they were yesterday's news. He was conquering the world of music. Great new products. Jobs was hurting his competitors. iTunes pretty well killed, killed off, the, off the music store. Um, and um, uh, Virgin Mega Stores, you know, slowly been disappearing around the world. In my stand-up show, I, there was one thing I did take the piss out of, which was the agreements, and it was, it was taking the piss out of it. It was endless, you know, sign a new agreement with iTunes. It says, have you read the terms of the agreement? And we all go, yes, I've read the terms of the agreement, and no one has ever in the world. No one. And one day, iTunes could come knocking on the door and say, you signed this thing. About 50 times, it said we could take your firstborn. So anything could be in there. We have no idea. Have you ever read it? Uh, no. no. Have you ever read it? Have you read it? No. Have you read it? No. No one. Zero. There should be five boxes of saying with different levels. Have you read it? No. Have you read half of it? No. Have you read a paragraph? No. Have you read a word of it? No. Have you not read it, but you don't care? Yeah. And if they come for your firstborn, yeah, I'll deal with it at the front door. Despite this, Half a million songs are downloaded on iTunes every day, often changing the lives of the artists concerned. Hip-hop group The Black Eyed Peas were asked to star in an iTunes commercial. They later became the most downloaded band on iTunes. But at the time, they didn't understand this new cultural phenomenon. They said, hey, they want to use a Black Eyed Peas song for an iTunes commercial. And I said, What's iTunes? And they said, uh, they're not paying much, but they're gonna give you guys iPods. What's an iPod? This is the new iPod now. But Jobs' influence on the music industry went far beyond simple star making. Way before iTunes, Steve Jobs has been a part of music because every major studio has a Mac computer in it. I mean, the Mac computer is an artist's computer. Musicians are still important, but people like Steve Jobs are uber, uber important. They bought CDs, and they want to buy downloads. People don't want to rent their music. Life in Apple's orchard had never been more fruitful. Then, Steve Jobs learned he had cancer. A standing ovation for Apple CEO. The years that followed were a roller coaster of hope and despair. I'm vertical. I'm back at Apple, loving every day of it. It is a little surreal. 
Most poignantly, he was asked what the next few years might hold. The future is long. <laughs> the last few years have reminded me that life is fragile. Um, you know... Finally, he withdrew from public life. Only his closest friends saw how he was coping with the threat of an early death. Steve Jobs loved to take walks. He did a lot of his thinking and his talking with his close friends, like Larry Ellison and a number of other people that he was friendly with in Silicon Valley, daydreaming ideas with people. One day, he conveyed to me that he would like me to come over to his house. And th this was uh, just after his liver transplant, which as we all know is a very serious kind of thing that takes a lot of recovery. And he wanted me to come over and just talk about industry gossip in a way, or events that had gone on since he'd been uh, kind of out of action. He was very frail. We talked about his health, and he talked about how he felt he was recovering. And in the middle of this, he said, uh, let's go for a walk. <laughs> and I said, really? Really, you're sure you want to go for a walk? We're about halfway to the neighborhood park, and he stops. You know, he wasn't like gasping for air or anything, but he was not a well-looking man. And I, I said, Steve, why don't we go back to the house? And he smiled or chuckled, and he said, uh, no, we're not going back to the house. I just need a minute, and then we're going to go on to the park, because that's my goal. I set a goal every day, and my goal now is to get to this park. I said, you're sure? And he said, yeah. So we walked to the park, and, you know, he was fine. And we got to the park, and uh, we sat on a bench, and we talked about, in the park, uh, as if I remember correctly, we actually talked more about life and health and you know I had had a heart attack some years before and he was lecturing me about that and I was sort of lecturing him as well about work-life balance and all these things and then we got up and walked back and talked some more and the last thing he said to me was you know Walt you and I have been through lots of adventures over the last 15 years and we're going to have some more adventures to come. We never did. On the 5th of October 2011, Steve Jobs died. The next day, his closest friend and colleague, Steve Wozniak, paid his own tribute. I'm going to miss the chance to go to him and just sit down and share, you know, just person to person. How much fun we had uh, in how much fun we had in those days doing things together, uh, you know, but you, you lose it. You can't ever go back and just just have those those conversations that make us both smile. As the world mourned, the most fitting tribute came from one of Steve Jobs' young fans. 19-year-old Hong Kong-based design student, Jonathan Mac Long, created an image on his Mac that went viral around the world. There was no real research behind it. I just uh, messed around on my computer and it just happened. Uh, it made sense to incorporate uh, his silhouette, his profile into the logo. It's gotten around um, 200,000 responses on my blog. Some people have said to me that the logo actually made them cry, and I thought it was a really strong reaction to have, but it, it made sense because, you know, Steve Jobs had such a big impact on our world. It wasn't just um, a person who made all these great gadgets, he actually changed the way that we communicate. I think the world will miss Steve Jobs. He took stuff to a new place, and I do identify with that. It's exciting when you do that, so I do find the excitement of that. And he also made things that were beautiful, great to touch, great to hold, and good to look at, in different colours.
And so we fall in love with Steve because he gave us these toys that were not only fun, but really useful. Wow. <laughs> He's changed the way we look at computers, phones, how we share, interact. He is going to inspire a whole new generation. Here's a guy who revolutionized the computer industry, the music industry, the motion picture industry, the telephone industry, there's four, and maybe more, that's impact. The minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, um, that's maybe the most important thing. Next Wednesday from 10, Fresh Meat is back on Channel 4. Rare to medium will do, and you can stuff your jacket potato. I want chips. Well, next tonight, an unlucky dog, a barking mad random.